this kind of goes back to a, a point that I think is super important uh, for anybody listening to this. The, I learned that I was good at sales, but I had no idea how to run a business and it crashed and burned. And I ended up having to give most of people their money back. Cause this is, this is what I've you know said before with coaching guys, they'll be like, you know, trying to validate an offer. And it's like, yeah, everyone's telling me it's awesome. Did they pay you? And they must not think it's that awesome it's like for people just starting out. It's like, man, you don't need another strategy. You just need to work. Right, like you just need to build a trait of focus and work ethic. Like you don't need some high level mentor right now. You can't even leverage high level mentorship because you aren't even, you can't even like just stay focused on work for two hours. Hi, everyone. We have got Brendan Coogan here. I'm going to do a short little intro, but he's going to expand on it a little bit more later. Essentially, Brendan started off in financial services before joining a software company. He was brought on by the two founders where he helped grow that software company from six figures a year to nine figures a year. So we've got an extraordinary entrepreneur on a call with us today. And he's going to share a little bit about his journey, some of the learning, some of the pitfalls that he teaches young entrepreneurs to avoid, while also talking a little bit about a family tragedy that ultimately led him to realise the important things about business and about life, which ultimately has helped him be an amazing coach for me. And I'm sure you guys are going to learn a lot from this conversation. Before I sort of run away or mess up any of the intro, Brendan, would you mind? introducing yourself and and telling our listeners watchers a little bit more about yourself please yeah yeah so essentially i've been an entrepreneur for 10 years had a handful of different businesses from financial services to being a partner in a SaaS company that does nine figures today and how i got connected to henry was because i am now have a business where I'm helping guys grow their businesses and get to where they want to go. And uh, Henry was one of the great guys that I uh, connected with in that journey so far. And I guess the, the the main piece that I guess I was interested in and something which we haven't really spoken too much before is about that SaaS experience. Cause I know that's, you've said it, I've said it. There's not that many guys that you're speaking with that are, that are in this world. But would you mind sort of telling yeah. a little bit more about that journey and uh, what that was like? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, to give a tiny bit more detail to that story or kind of how that even all came to be, <laughs> was that I had a uh, financial services business and I did really well at that. Essentially, how I got into that was that I had done a couple things before that had done well for like, um, I guess, for a young guy just starting out, but definitely knew I had a lot to learn and wasn't able to take them that far. Then I got a mentor that really helped me figure out how to build this financial services business, had a handful of guys underneath me that we were mainly focused on selling kind of financial products more from the investment standpoint. So yeah. annuities, uh, uh, getting assets under management, that sort of stuff. Then I got connected to these brothers that had started this uh, software company uh, doing construction software. And essentially, long story short, a guy that I knew, this kind of goes back to a, a point that I think is super important uh, for anybody listening to this. The power of networking is, is huge because it was because I knew one guy that then knew another guy that worked for these guys that then I heard about it. And I was like, essentially what I was, was kind of conveyed to me was like, these guys have a great software. They're doing a great job developing it, but they don't really know like how to build a business, um, how to scale a business, anything like that. And so I got connected to these brothers and through a series of conversations, we made the decision that it'd be best for me to come in and partner with them and be the customer service sales side of the business to help them scale it. And uh, that went really well. Uh, essentially, it. I'll say I, I don't like to take too much credit for that because what, what I believe is that it's really the world-class product that when you have that, it makes it much easier much to market easier. and to sell. Much, and much so easier. 
our solution was so good that that's why I, I was, you know, almost salivating over coming into this business and partnering with these guys. Cause they just seemed like such great guys um, that had something that I don't think they really even knew how valuable it was. And so then went from a handful of people in sales and customer service to um, a lot more than that in a pretty short period of time. And over about a three year period, we went from a small company to a, uh, to a large one. Um, I'm not at liberty to say too many specifics, uh, but it. I think as far as what I, a few of the biggest things that I learned on that journey, one was that the way that you lead people is so, so crucial because a lot of the strategies, yes, they change somewhat, but a lot of the strategies aren't super hard to understand or to execute. It's it's really about how how do you invest in your people? How do you develop them to where they feel like, man, I don't I don't want to work for anyone else. Like I know that this is this is the best place that I could work. And these are the these are the best people that I could work for. Yeah. And so I think the thing that I was honestly most proud of is that we got voted the both for small business. And then when we went higher, the large business category for the best place to work in Omaha. And I think that's what I was most proud of more than the numbers themselves was that what I learned along the way and what I think led to our success wasn't that I was uh, the smartest guy in the world or even the smartest guy in the room, but that I just really loved the people that, that we had. And I, uh, I just really wanted to see them win and I was willing to do whatever it took to empower them and develop them into yeah. the roles that they wanted to have, who they wanted to be. You touched upon it then, you sort of said how important the team is. Um, and ultimately, I guess, you know, when you get that team position right, you get synergy between team members, people want to be there. They give more than just the nine to five, the bog standard. What what would you say were the two other key things that you learned on top of that that team point that ultimately led to getting you're not giving away too much details and their listeners or yeah. one of those sort of numbers which you, you don't have to share. But what what ultimately was it that the the two things you learned that got you from where you started to then where where you ended up when now yeah you're in a pretty comfortable position yeah good question I'd say the next one that first comes to mind is I'll maybe kind of separate one out into sales as that was really the the most major thing that obviously I was leading was when it came to building sales teams. Um, one mistake that I think people make is they think, oh, I'm going to try to hire veteran salespeople. Uh, but what I found was that hiring teams of young guys that were like Hungry. just out of college um and then just essentially instilling in them my way of doing things is what really worked and essentially what that way of doing things was to put it simply was just giving them a high level of conviction in what we were doing there and then just getting them on the phone like it really wasn't that complicated it was just showing them this is how much we're helping people with their businesses with our software and so you are doing people a disservice by not getting them on a presentation to at least show them what we have to offer. And I really think that that's something that's an important takeaway when you're scaling a business and you're scaling a sales team is it's so much less about someone's experience level. Conviction is going to beat experience every time. Uh, the other thing is taking the time to hire the right people, especially for leadership positions. And yeah. what's interesting about this is it kind of changes a little bit as you scale, because at the beginning, you can focus more on just getting people that really aren't entrepreneurial at all. Like you don't want to hire yourself, no. right? No. You, want to, you want to hire people that want to be, want to work for a good company that want a safer, uh, situation, paycheck, you know, that sort of stuff, um, want to have their life and be able to clock in, clock out and it not take over your life. Like your business is taking over your life at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. but 
then when you bring in A players that are actually leading your teams, it changes a little bit because you do want them to be somewhat entrepreneurial and you do want to compensate them based on their performance to a degree, but it's, it's kind of almost like a halfway in between, right? Where they're kind of entrepreneurial, but they don't want to go full out and start their own business. They want to operate in a framework where they can try things, where they can really grow something and where there's a much higher cap to how much they can make. So in that case, it's still kind of entrepreneurial, um, yeah, but they that they're still in a larger framework where there's yeah. less risk, less, yeah, there's more structure, those sorts of things. One of my mentors, he put it this way that I liked. He's like, a lot of people, they just, they want to be in that corral. Whereas if you just throw down the corral and it's like, just the world is completely open to you. That's too much for a lot of people. And so, you know, even, even having that corral and then, you know, growing that corral as you grow your company, that can still be a big corral for them to do a lot of cool things in, but it still keeps it within that, that structure yeah. kind of kills, yeah. still keeps them in the safety of that kind of larger yeah, structure. Yeah, the security that yeah. So I'd say those are two big things. The last thing I'll throw in as a quick third is just taking the time to to really find the right people. I I think this was something I learned with my first business where I learned that I was good at sales, but I had no idea how to run a business and it crashed and burned and I ended up having to give most of people their money back. Um was that you don't just focus on selling all the time and this and that, and then just hire people on the, you know, first interview or like the first person that you interview or whatever the case is. And it might sound obvious, but I think it's an important thing because I know it's something that I've done. And that I've seen other guys do where you're just trying to grow quickly. And every hour that you're putting into searching for people and interviewing people and whatever, um, you're not seeing that direct ROI right away. But I promise you that finding the right people it's everything. And yeah. so putting the time into doing that, taking, you know, 10 hours that you're putting into searching and interviewing for uh, positions is crucial. I guess it's so what that's, the same, that's, I'd say, it, kind of a fourth thing I learned. Yeah. And then in, in startups, is that hire slow, fire fast sort of catchphrase? Yep. I haven't really done too much of the firing, um, but I have seen firsthand how. Yeah, hiring slow and taking the time to make sure that that is someone because hiring's hard. I have found that it is a lot harder than I thought to find people that are good mm -hmm. because so many people just want to do the bare minimum and just go, and that's completely okay. But you're right as a business owner and especially those first hires, you can't afford someone that just comes in and does the bare minimum. You have to have someone that strives for perfection. And it's easy for us to say as business owners because it's ultimately our blood, sweat and tears that we're putting on the line. But finding that person yeah. that's willing to, to strive for perfection for something that isn't their own blood, sweat and tears is really difficult to find, but, you know, crucial to, to get right or as close to right as possible. Yeah, yeah. And it's the the old saying is true of like, hiring is guessing firing is knowing that being said i think people can use that as an excuse to not get good and have a build a world-class hiring process that can really help you filter out people based on the skills traits and beliefs that you're looking for in that specific role and so i think there's a lot of things that you can do but ultimately it is difficult and when you go high enough that's the main thing that you're going to hear guys complaining about right? They figured out like what they're like, how they can scale this thing, what all the systems and processes, the offers, the, all that sort of stuff. And they're just like, it's just hard for me to find enough good people that I can depend upon. And that's, that becomes most guys bottlenecks. And that's why actually one of my good friends, he decided to start a recruiting agency and he's done really well because that's what we found was that just so many guys, that's that's what they have a hard time with. And so they're willing to pay a lot for good people if you can hand them to them on a silver platter. Yeah. And especially as you know, a lot of the a lot of the best people are already hired, right? Exactly. And we're recruited to target those. Because especially if I was hiring, well, I would only target someone that was in a job if I already knew them. So there's this whole pool of talent out there, which 
I wouldn't tap into. Yeah, yeah. The best people always, always have jobs. Yeah. So yeah, how do you how do you go and uh, poach those people? Or, is, or uh, don't want to work for someone, or think they don't until the right opportunity comes along and there's an exciting enough project. Because I really resonate with what you said earlier about everything just comes a lot easier when the product's amazing, and I think that is in in SaaS as a whole. That's why I think it's so important to spend a lot more time on that demand-based starting point. You are creating something based upon demand so that when you know you create something, there's not only a market pull, but then there's a good push because you've got a fantastic product. And that's what I see a lot of people do wrong. They've got an idea, they want to turn it into software, but they don't actually spend the time thinking, is there demand and have we got the ability to create the ability and experience to create a world-class product because not a lot of people do that's why SaaS is so difficult yeah one of the it reminds me of one of the age-old marketing things I can't remember who said it but he poses this question of if you had a hot dog stand what would be the most important thing you can give different answers to that you know have the best hot dogs you know do this do that whatever the case is and then when he gives the answer at the end, he says a starving crowd. If there's thousands of people, drunk people coming out of a football game and your hot dog stand is there, your hot dogs can be terrible and they will sell out. Yeah. And so it goes back to that a little bit of um, not, not that that's I'm countering what we just said, but in the way that like you, you need to position what you have as somewhere where there's a starving crowd. And if there's not, then you can constitute all you want logically that this is such a great thing. But if there's not a starving crowd for yeah. it, then find something else. Yeah. It, I, but sometimes that's hard to accept because you create, you've got a little baby, you've got this thing that you think is going to do so well. You often can't accept the fact that someone won't pay for it. Like this. I, I've had it with previous businesses. You jump on a call with someone and tell them about your software. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I'd love to use it. Are they actually going to pay for it there? Is it something that's going to solve their problem? And hundreds, I mean, it has to be thousands of people have a pro problem for it to become profitable. And you got to figure that out pretty quick. Yeah, and also talk is cheap, right? Cause this is, this is what I've you know said before with coaching guys, they'll be like, you know, trying to validate an offer. And it's like, yeah, everyone's telling me it's awesome. Did they pay you? And they must not think it's that awesome. So that's, what's important is ideas are cheap. Execution is everything. So make sure that you're actually going out and testing that because I think that's where it gets hard when is when people are getting too attached to an idea because they didn't go about testing that idea the right way. Yeah. They didn't go yeah. about validating that offer. And now they've put months and months in or even years in when they didn't validate their offer right from the beginning, that's on you. Like there's a right and wrong way to do it. And now you're months, years down the road in a hard position. And now you have to decide, am I going to be decisive? Which is what I see is a really important trait of successful entrepreneurs that I know is they're decisive and they're not afraid to change direction when they get new information. Yeah. Yeah, I am um, actually one of the next videos after this on my YouTube channel will be titled How to Come Up With SaaS Ideas. And in that, I present three ways to come up with SaaS ideas. But I promise at the start that ideas are everywhere. Everyone comes up with a billion dollar idea, but it's ex execution ultimately that decides whether you make money from it or not, or it becomes successful or not. And that, yeah, that's definitely. probably what I've, what I've, what I, what, well, if anything, you've educated me a lot about coaching is I think you summed it up pretty well about like exiting software companies. We spoke about the different possibilities of my software and the different things that I want to do, the scaling, the exit opportunities. And you said that the reason a lot of times people think about ex exiting is they don't have the knowledge to be able to put in a team in place where it can run autonomously or grow autonomously yeah. and that's where you realize you definitely do get into points in business where you do just need a coach a mentor a role model who's been there done that 
to educate you on how to get to the next step of your business. And I feel I'm definitely at that stage with my agency where I need that support to get to the next step. And I have no doubt that towards the end of this year, I'll get to the same point in my software company where it will be, how do we get to the next step? What does that look like? And what do I need to do to be able to get there? Yeah. Yeah, and I think what's so fitting about that is that just like in your journey for a lot of people, it's starting out, you just have to execute, like just make it happen, right? You know, just making a few thousand dollars a month and getting to, you know, 10K a month, whatever the case is, you, you just got to put in the work. And then you get to that point where just like you're saying, it's like, man, I, I need more direction here. Like I, at this point, I'm not sure. I kind of understand where I want to go and kind of how to do it, but I'm just not quite sure. Like, it seems like if I make the wrong calls from here, this could be really bad news. And if I make the right ones, it could scale quickly just when I'm looking at it logically, but I've never done this before. And it starts to also get a little scary as we've talked about before. You start to think about things a little differently when a bunch of people and their families are now dependent on your decisions. And so that's where I find when with the higher you, you go in this game that you need a good coach to make, to help you make sure that you're, you're making the right moves and that you're uh, also keeping your head right because also it only, the pressure only builds and the mental uh, struggles that can come along with that, that if I didn't have the mentorship that I did, I don't think I would have gotten very far past kind of that first phase, yeah. which I mean, you can still make more than like most people in Western, in the Western world. But if you really want to get to that very meaningful impact that I want to have, that you want to have, I think that's just what it takes. Yeah, I, I'd agree because the first hurdle is execution, which we know firsthand a lot of people, a lot of people lack the ability to execute and just put in that hard work. And then yes. once you've got past that initial speed bump, it's then right, we know we can work hard. What systems do we need to put in place in order to scale? Yeah, exactly. And that's that's one thing I will say is like for people just starting out, it's like, man, you don't need another strategy. You just need to work. Right, like you right. just need to build a trait of focus and work ethic. Like you just need to do that for a while. Like you don't need some high level mentor right now. You can't even leverage high level mentorship because you aren't even, you can't even like just stay focused on work for two hours. Yeah, people, people addicted to the phone addicted to porn addicted to junk food all these things yeah. and then then they're looking at their life and seeing they're not living how they want it to how they want to live and it's like or don't even realize that they're not living the life that they want to live and then thinking that it's a higher pro and that a coach is going to fix that it's like a, yeah a coach is it's like you can only help people that want to be helped and have a growth mindset to be able to look internally and want to fix that yeah, what I find is that most people in that position, they think that they just need a better strategy. And I think there's a lot of gurus that play on that. Oh, you yeah. just need this one secret strategy. Pay me a couple thousand dollars and you'll get this course. But it's easier to think that it's the strategy, that the strategy is the problem and it's not you. But it's when people actually look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. There's maybe a lot of reasons why I have these bad habits, why I am where I am, but I can either be a victim of my circumstances or I can choose to believe what I find that the successful entrepreneurs that I look up to believe, which is that I'm not a victim of my circumstances. I create my circumstances. Yeah. And so that's the mindset shift you have to have and then just execute, execute. And if you do that, then you'll get there because like you're going to learn. Like, even if you're not the smartest guy in the room, if you just put in enough volume, you're going to figure it out. Yeah, that's something that I've always lived by. I've never been the smartest person in the, work, in, in the room. I don't think I'm particular. I don't know about that. I, I would say I've developed. When, when I started, definitely not. I've, I would say I was very 
immature. I didn't necessarily have a growth mindset when I started. However, I, I identified pretty quickly that that doesn't really matter to begin with. It's just putting in yeah. the work. So I was like, right, let's just get my head down. I wasn't a, I I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was smart at school, but I got first at university, got A's and A stars at school. Um, and that was just through hard work. And then now I feel like I've earned the respect and the position where now that those fine tuning and that strategy matters and makes sense, which I'm, ex- I'm yeah. excited for. I'm yeah. excited for, yeah, man. For, you, for you to help me get there. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be uh it's going to be an incredible year for you. That's for sure. And one thing that I do want to touch on real quick uh, that you mentioned earlier, it, it's not that I'm saying that there isn't a place to, um, to exit a company to sell. No, no. You know, for example, there are certain times where the times where you should exit is when there is a larger company that can leverage what you have created much more than you can, because then they're going to pay a premium for that thing, right? But if they're just paying the market value, market then that then that doesn't make sense, right? That's where that applies. And I think that's a far majority of cases when people exit things. But there are certain things where where that's not the case. Yeah. You know, for example, for you, if Squarespace goes, man, we really want your software. We're willing to pay you this, you know, this much for it. And it's much higher than the market value. Okay. Well, that might make sense, but that's because they're Squarespace yeah, and you're Henry, right? So they can yeah. leverage that much more than Henry can at this stage. And so that's the sort of situations where it does make sense. Uh, but it's good to have all that in place because then also, even in those situations, you have the leverage because you are confident in your ability to continue to scale the company if you are not acquired. And that gives yeah. you even more leverage in those conversations. Yeah. It's it's like, um, you know, Google's acquisition of DeepMind, Adobe's acquisition of Figma, when you've got exciting standalone companies that are able to, to be there and grow themselves, then, yeah. then you've got leverage over the big boys that want to come in and, utilize what you have to to open a different avenue or build a competitive advantage or yep. capture a competitor competitor like Adobe did with Figma. Yep, exactly. I, I guess Brendan, we've got a couple of other points that we said speaking about. I think it's quite important to I don't I don't know how much detail you want to go into it, but I think some I feel the different life experiences that you've had at I guess a relatively young age still um not not too much older than me has put you in a position where you've you're definitely very wise and you've got the ability to help people in all areas of life not just business that we've experienced would you mind telling the audience a little bit about why you transitioned away from business and what your life looks like now which we can sort of set up nicely into the next steps. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I appreciate you saying that. Um, essentially, what happened was, you know, kind of picking up in my story, kind of where I left off really with the software company is I decided that I wanted to essentially take everything that I learned in the software company and now apply that back to financial services, go more broad and like do ever like all financial services, right? And have uh scale it much more aggressively, build a much bigger team underneath me, etc. So I uh was doing that and that became my main focus. And then about eight months into doing that, my wife and my their three and four at the time were hit by a dump truck on the highway and the debris from the dump truck uh hit my three-year-old uh in the head and he had to be airlifted and when they started emergency brain surgery he was minutes from dying from his his brain hurting so essentially from there it was uh 
it was a much different road than I expected. But what I knew was I did a a mental exercise that I've done whenever I face big decisions, which is when I'm when I'm 80, what am I gonna care about that I that I did or that I didn't do? And essentially what I realized at that time was when I look back at this time, I'm not going to care about how much business success I had or any of that. All I'm going to care about is, was I there for my son, most importantly, and for my family? And so I immediately sold it to the financial services business to a friend that was really good at taking care of his clients and not as good at getting them. So it was kind of a great fit that way because I knew that he would take great care of, of all of my clients. And um, at the same time, it grew his business massively. Uh, and then I turned my focus to, to him. And essentially that was a, a crazy journey of going different places. We you know moved states for a while where he was getting hyperbaric oxygen therapy there, all this sort of stuff. And essentially, thankfully made a miraculous recovery for an incredibly severe brain injury. And today his capability is far beyond what anyone uh, thought was possible other than the one doctor that did do the hyperbaric oxygen. And um, essentially I had a different perspective on my career after that. And so as things stabilized, you know, that was June 9th, 2021. So it's been about uh, over a year and a half, a little over a year and a half That's since a lot then. Sooner than, I, than I thought it was. I thought it was, yeah, yeah, like four or five years ago. But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. it hasn't even been two years. Incredible. Um, and so essentially, as things stabilized, we were back home. I felt like I had, you know, almost kind of thought of it a little bit like a business. Like, how do I get this set up to where, like, I know that he's getting everything that he could possibly need. And I'm just going to put all of my time into it until then. And then as I see that me putting any more time than this amount of threshold isn't going to get him any more benefit when I'm giving him that quality time, when I'm making sure he's getting all the treatments he needs, all those sorts of things, then I can start to look at what I do next. And what I realized was that what had led to my success and what I really enjoyed about business up until that point was investing in people developing people. And so I thought, how could I make a business that was just completely centered around that, where I'm not just doing that for my team, but I'm actually doing that for my clients. And I thought, whoa, the most impactful way to do that would be to do that for the owners of other businesses. Because then the umbrella effect of that is that then I invest and develop that individual. Yeah. And then everyone that's under him is then impacted right? All of those families, all of those people, all of their clients. That's broader impact. Yeah. And so then I was like, okay, then this is what makes sense. So how am I going to go about doing that? And I thought about that for a while, talked to different people that are actually doing the things, things the right way in the online entrepreneurship space. Cause I know there's a, there's a lot of bad actors out there that yeah, are taking advantage of people. Insane. And so finding the, uh, finding the right people that are actually, giving people a ridiculous ROI on, you know, what they're investing into their programs and just really helping them get where they want to be. Cause ultimately that's what I realized is that what I wanted to do was create a world-class process to get an entrepreneur from where they are to where they want to be and become who they want to be in the process. Not to talk about that too much, but I, I've just found that when people start on the journey and they really get into it, what, what they find, especially looking back is that they care less about what it is specifically that they accomplished and more about who it made them into. And when I look back, the thing that I'm most thankful for, it isn't the money. It's the, I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better friend because of the character traits skills and beliefs that I had to develop out of necessity to get where I wanted to go in business. And so that, that tied it in even deeper for me of just my passion to make this happen. 
And so I started that by making one post in a networking group seven months ago uh, that Henry's actually uh, a part of, uh, very active in, and is um, actually recognized for that as a as an MVP uh, in in the network. It's called uh, Jen's Croquet Club uh, because he's you know helped so many people and made one post, got more applicants than I knew what to do with, which kind of gave me actually going back to something we said earlier, like a starving oh crowd. Gosh. It's like there are so many um, entrepreneurs that they're like, I, yes, I want, me- like, I want mentorship. I need someone to help me scale my business. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so then from there, I picked a handful of guys and coached them one-on-one and essentially was like, I'm going to just pick guys from different tiers of what they're making, all that sort of stuff. Just focus on the right character traits I'm looking for. And then help them make this this massive shift, this massive change, and then just take note of everything I learned along the way to apply to a mastermind because I realized that a mastermind would be the best format to make the biggest impact leverage wise because then you have that collaboration, all those entrepreneurs benefiting each other, creating that flywheel effect. And so I was like, I know that's the end goal, but I think that this is the best way to get there. Like just yeah. start with this. And then over those seven months, I can build out what this should look like. And that also goes to another thing of like long-term thinking. When you talk to people at higher levels, they're thinking a lot more long-term than people that um, are newer to entrepreneurship. Part of that can be on necessity. Like if you just need to pay your bills, you're going to think short-term and like that's yeah. that's fine, Right. Um, but I had the luxury to think more long-term and then now that, uh, launches here in, in a couple weeks and yeah. I'm, uh, really excited to help these guys get where they want to be. But I think that's, that's one thing that I think is really important is thinking about in a circumstance, like what is, what is my perspective? Because I think what I realized when the accident happened was that, I could have chosen to let it destroy me or I could choose to let it make me better to refine me. I'm a, I'm a Christian. And one thing that's talked about a lot in scripture is that death to self, like letting those, letting those parts die that are those selfish, more childish parts of yourself and let the, the man that you really want to become that you believe you were created to be come through, but it's a painful death to self process. And so I, I just told myself I'm willing to go through that refinement to become who I'm supposed to be. And I'll be on that journey for the rest of my life. And no way am I saying I've arrived, but I'm thankful for the opportunities of growth that I have had over the past couple of years. Yeah. Cause you can, whenever something happens, you can always, you, well, you can look at it, but I, I know we're sort of in the same mindset. You can look at it in a number of ways, but for me, often the best way to look at it is this has happened. What can I control in order to make this the best situation even given unfortunate circumstances to ensure that in your case, your family, yourself are as happy as possible. And, you know, when anything bad happens, it's always just about how can I make sure that I can make the best out of a bad situation? Cause that's ultimately the only thing that you can control now it's happened. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, you can, you can take someone that grew up in a, in a war zone in a third world country and you can take someone that grew up in a spoiled, in a rich Western family, and then you put them in the same situation and see how their perspectives are going to be different and how that's going to change how they handle things. Yeah. Right. And so that's also why we see in in society how making life easier and easier isn't improving people's quality of well-being. Why is that? Well, as human beings, we we are made to to be refined, to go through challenges that grow us. And that's important. 
And if you don't create them yourself, then they're going to come at you. And maybe they'll come at you anyway, even if you, if you, even if you do create them yourself, it's like uh, Jordan Peterson says, pick your damn sacrifice because you're, you're either going to have the sacrifice or the, the pain of regret or the pain of growth and, and walking through a hard challenge. And so I'd rather pick the sacrifice of, of that. And I think that's the ultimate driver for me. And honestly, I found is the biggest driver for a lot of guys is thinking about the regret I will feel by not living the life that I know that I could impacting the amount of people that I know that I could, if I put down my own selfish desires and continue to choose to go through those growth pains. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that to, to close on really, does it? No, I don't think so. Hopefully it's, um, for those listening, it's been a little bit of a snapshot into how Brennan thinks and I've always been, I've always found that often the best mentors, they don't tell you what to do. They ask the right questions. And I feel as if you do a fantastic job of doing that while also following up those questions and those realizations with really good analogies, really good points that I guess lower a bit of light, a bit of fire under your belly as well, which I think. I, I definitely feel off off the back of the, this chat and hopefully other people will do too. So what's the best way for people to connect with you, Brandon? Yeah, um, you can go to my my YouTube channel, um, Brendan Coogan underscore. Uh, you can uh, go to the website at apex3.co, um, www.apex3.co. And uh, there you can learn more about why we do what we do, what exactly we do. Um, and yeah, I would say those are the the main ways you can connect with me. I am newly on Instagram, so you can also uh, look me up there as well. Th- thanks a lot for your time, Brendan. Looking forward to, to speaking soon. And hopefully this will get a few more people to, to be aware of who you are and what you do. Yeah. Thanks, Henry. Really appreciate it, man. Cheers, mate.